Get That Monster Off The Stage, the story of Fimber Donnelly and his band's non-attacks, Five Go Down To The Sea and Beethoven. Um, where to begin? Where to begin? I, I remember walking home one night from the arc room and it started snowing. There was a, we used to go up Assumption Hill and there was a field in on the right and like I, I took a left there, he used to go straight on. And uh, I said goodnight to him anyway, and he ran into the field and started rolling around in the snow because you know, he felt like it. And he was there for hours, seemingly. <laughs> but I had gone home, he told me this the next day. That was just like, you know, he wanted to roll in the snow, so off he went. When a guy dies, often a hero's made, right? But the fact is that he was really large in life and real life, you know? I'll take you home to my daddy And he'll make a nice cup of tea I'd like to eat Donnelly uh, and this Cork surrealism. And actually, I don't think it's actually surreal. I think uh, the phrase I'd actually use it for is uh, uh, surlifeism. It's actually life just gone slightly beyond the bounds of plausibility. And uh, it, it seems surreal, but it actually does happen. And like a prime example now, Danley is. Um, but I was walking down by the statue and he was coming up the road. I don't know who he was with, he was with Smelly or Ricky or Philip or something, I don't know, right? And they were equipped by Eason's. And I crossed over, I was just, whatever, nothing made just how's it going, what's the crack, what are you up to, right? He was eating, you know, those skull loaves of bread, it's a, it's a loaf of bread, and it, it's a, sort of a round loaf of bread, they've got a hard crust and a really soft bread inside it. And he had one of those under his arm and he was eating the white out of the bread, just chatting to the lads, right? And um, so all that was left was the crust and he was eating the bread, right? And next thing it started raining, you know? He just finished the bed and put the crust on his head, you know. It was just the size of his head, you know. It was like, and I, and I just thought, that's amazing. That loaf of bread is called a skull, and it fits his head perfectly, right? And just, he just, you know, the, the conversation ended, and they just head off up the street, and he was quite happy there with the, the loaf of bread in his head, you know, and the skull on his head. And I just thought, that's, you know, and at the time, you don't think much of it. I mean, no doubt, probably the following week, someone said, yeah, Lang, I was downtown last week, and he had a loaf of bread in his head, you know. But... It's only when you look back in retrospect, you say, that's brilliant, you know? That really is brilliant. That's that's performance going on there, right? And he knew exactly what he was at, and it wasn't like a, a gobbin on life, or it wasn't doing the punk thing, spitting on the road, right? But there was a major statement. There was, you could call it, uh, and not putting too many words in it, right? But, you know, you could call it performance art in some way, right? And there's no doubt that the irony of putting, you know, a skull on your head... You know, certainly crossed his mind, you know, and but without passing comment on it, right, and just left it there. And I just thought that's typical, you know, that's that, that's the guy that we all knew, right? I actually met his brother first. I used to work with a chipper in Shannon Street. We kind of had an interest in UFOs. Donnelly was interested in UFOs as well. And that, he introduced me to Donnelly from that, for that reason. I haven't met Donnelly then. Like, he introduced me to this whole, this whole new world of punk, rock, new wave, or whatever you might call it at the time. Like, at that time, I'd have been listening to Status Quo and Pink Floyd and all that kind of thing. Like, and I thought that was cool, like, I thought that was great, but uh, no, he introduced me into the world of John Peel, alternative music, many nights we spent trying to tune into radio, BBC Radio 1, it was a very really tough station, like, it still is actually, we had no intentions of forming a band, but I, ha- I had kind of slight aspirations before I met on the, uh, I had bought a guitar, electric guitar, right? on a school tour, we bought a guitar for £19 in Bristol. And myself, Philip and Smelly were in school together in the school to come. Actually, one day we, we, we said, why did we ask Donnelly to sing that? Because he knows sing. I, I think for ages, when, when we were at the time with J.D. David Band, we were telling him about it, and he, he wasn't saying anything. Like, and when we asked him, he kind of lit, lit up a bit. Like, I remember it was up to Glen. I was walking down Assumption Hill, it's gone now, like, and uh, I said, what did you sing? 
<laughs> there it was, mate. Right? Still ain't even myself. And that was it. The, uh, Danny came up to me then, like up to me bed for one night, with pages and pages of lyrics. And I'd say, I'd say it was the first time he ever wrote down lyrics, and it's probably the last time as well. You know, and so we went into the bedroom, like we started doing these two chord wonder songs, like. So, one thing led to another, like. Smelly got involved, Philip started playing the bass, everything was grand, ready for the gig. Played a gig up in Mayfield Community School, I remember it was Valentine's Day, I think it was 78 or something like that. And it went down from there, like. We were shocking, like, Jesus, you can imagine. You could imagine, like, we were playing Teenage Kicks, um, pretty vacant. A few covers, a few of our own songs then, like that Donnelly had done the lyrics and we put the music together from. But it moved on from there. Was it the Arcadia? Curiously enough, I mean, I think that's where most people met each other at that time. Obviously he was one of the more extraordinary looking people in Cork. Uh, I mean, my own background was pretty, pretty dull, you know, lower middle class. One of those schools. UCC, driving me insane. You know, I wanted to be involved in music, but I didn't know anybody who was doing that sort of thing, so I just struck up a conversation with him, because he looked like the kind of person who, who ought to know about these things. And uh, after a fashion, he did. I mean, he turned out to be an extremely friendly person, which surprised me. In fact, I mean, you couldn't get rid of him, really. I got to know Ricky, you know, within a few minutes. And the whole the whole circle I took to going to their their jams at um, a sm- Smelly and Phillips family house up in um, Farnley, I think it was. I, I honestly can't remember quite exactly where it was because I'm fairly crap at these details. But um, thought these were kind of social occasions, sitting in a very small bedroom, listening <laughs> to four people making a loud noise. And late, I forget when exactly that was. I think it was like late in 1979 or 1978. I'm really, really not too sure. And sometime after that, I met Sean O'Hagan and started doing music myself. And but we would stayed close, as you have to do in Cork. You know, you're close whether you like it or not. Donnelly used to used to be um, a mixture of absolute charm and politeness and unpredictable attack. He, he was very funny, very smart. I, I, could, I couldn't get used to somebody who didn't play the life game of actually not saying what you think. You know, you, you think something, but you don't say it. Donnelly would think something and say it, and then question you for sort of saying, "Why shouldn't I say it?" You know, and I found that really extraordinary—not confrontational, but extraordinary. And um, I was a little bit afraid of him for a while, but then I learned not to be afraid of him and kind of used to enjoy sort of talking to him in calmer moments. And as on, in a one-to-one situation, Donnelly was very, very enjoyable and you'd get a lot out of him and he'd just start, start talking about books, what he'd been reading and of course he's reading like voraciously and incredibly turned on bloke. In a group with a few other people, he used to be a performer and you wouldn't get to the kind of Intelli- well, intelligent Donnelly, the more, I don't know, uh, uh, expensive Donnelly. He used to be the performer, he used to be a centre of attention, always funny. You And, and, and the, the weird thing is, once you got to know Donnelly, and then somebody else came into the group, like, a, you know, somebody else came in, you know, sort of, and, and met Donnelly for the first time, you knew that this person was in for this kind of, sort of, slight baptism of fire. First of all, being confronted by this character, trying to understand and being shocked, getting to know, and then realising that it was a bit of shadow boxing going on, you know. We got in Mick Finnegan, who came in with us. He came up uh, to, <laughs> in interview. He came up and he, he could play it, the soul of Hotel California. And we said, all right, you're in, you can play it. And he kind of started off, he was kind of the first, first proper musician that was ever involved with us. Like Mick was there for a while, but maybe he, he, he wasn't on the same level, of the punk level as us. He was more rock orientated. Like. Later in the, uh, the thing, it was Gerdy came on board. I mean, Gerdy is excellent, fantastic. Our, our music suited him down to the ground, like, it was fantastic. But he jumped ship, he went over to the opposition, he joined Fianna Fáil, he joined Michael Disney. <laughs> we never forgave him for that, like, never. But his, his musical influence was fantastic. 
because he was very, very, very talented. But as I say, he jumped ship. So after none attacks uh, exploded on the scene, as it were, everybody, including Cahill and Sean and McClint, said, Jesus, we can do that. So before long, within six months, they were getting their things together under the same spirit, like, if none of things can do it, uh, so can we. If Donnelly can do it, I can do it, kind of thing. Because everybody looked up to Donnelly, basically, like he was the uh, he was the number one kind of character around the place. Nobody was particularly making any money through doing music, and Cork was falling apart because of the fact was it closed down, and the, you know, it was just getting crappier and crappier. Nobody... You know, talking about the widest sort of cross-section of people under 25 especially had any money. So people stopped going to gigs, they stopped going to the Arcadia anyway. So um, there was really nothing much you could do to sort of push things forward. And um, that caught at the campus record that was recorded, that gig came out and uh, it didn't really do anything. The next song is about psychiatrists and stuff rubbish. Even though, the, you know, the Nuna Tax tracks were great. I mean, it really caught them at what they were doing at that time. I mean, the Mike Risen track was shite, but I mean, it was neither here nor there. And, like, be- before that, with none, the one with Nuna Tax, before that was White Cortina. It was just the lads kind of rabbiting on about, you know, the only thing to go on is a White Cortina. Brilliant. Chased home after the gig by the, the clan from the north side, things like that. Fights, a lot of fights, punks sticking together, mods. It was the time of the air guitar, people out dancing to ACDC. Good times, um, that song by Chic, that used to finish the disco, two o'clock, Saturday nights. They always played the same tune, I always remember that. Um, I remember a lot of skinheads, got lots of memories. First time I saw a knife. So it's like all these kind of images, you know. The first time I, I met like people like Blake Creedon and first time I met Ricky Deneen or Finbar Donnelly, you know. Like up the Ark, and I can still remember the first time I met most of them, you know. The Ark was completely different and completely weirder than anywhere else because you, you had you had a kind of an arty element, but it wasn't like it, it looked arty, but it wasn't, if you know what I mean, like you know. Musically, all these people were listening to Captain Beefheart and Throb and Grizzle were popular at the time and the Virgin Prunes used to come to Cork and play in the Ark and go down better in Cork than they did in, Do- than they did in Dublin. But some people, like the ska heads that would be in the Ark, would look at the Virgin Prunes in the same way as the Legion of Mary would look at Satan, if you know what I mean. But um, out of that, you had a lot of really strange bands coming. I can remember seeing one band up in the art college, one I called The Women. What it was, it was um, they were amazing. Like, it was like DAF style keyboards, tribal drumming. No melody, no tune, nothing. It went down a storm. People loved it. And like at the time, the whole scene, what, there was none attacks, Micro Disney, uh, ourselves, DC, well, the Dublin bands coming down, the Flamax, you know. Belson and whatever and it was just a great thing because you had the bands coming down to the Ark okay they might bring a support band with them but there does always be a local band playing so because of that then people were seeing you in action and then if you were having a gig down in you know Heafy's or in Henry's or wherever people would come along and see you incestuous bunch really like punks and their their models and then there was a couple of sort of mods hanging on in that you know the two-tone stuff was happening then as well so it was a big sort of upsurge in that whole sort of look or feel about things the good times i suppose the good times were going up to dublin we used to play up in the magnet we almost had a residency of cork bands up there every saturday night Packaged up to be main features and none attacks and Micro Disney and the Flamex or, or you know subtle variations on that. 
they were they were hilarious. Like you know, people in people in Dublin didn't know what to make this. Two good things coming up from Cork. Who didn't give a shit about anything? Right? Um, it's tickling and pink. There was definitely a stopping and taking of stock up there when Nine Attacks arrived and did what they did. It was like, hang on a minute, you know, it was almost like there were a million bar bands in Dublin, you know, like, sort of the lights and the this, the that. There was, lot, there was a lot of pointy shoes and bow legged stances and skinny ties, and, and of course, when Nine Attacks went up there with braces and big country pants and silly grins and this, this, this music that was. You know, most people sort of said, oh, it's beef heart, isn't it? You know, which wasn't, it's much more than that. And they introduced this kind of very kind of experimental edge to a kind of, to what people thought was punk rock in those days. It was definitely a sort of, a, a sort of element of surprise. I think he was craving, actually craving the attention for the sake of the band and for the sake of the image. Thank you. To be honest with you, like, and he, he, he was very w- well read and just on a one-to-one basis with Don Lee, he was practically a normal person, like, did have his psychotic moments after drink or whatever. But uh, I would imagine that most of the thing was a show for just to be a part you know what you know what I mean, like a rock star type of a part type of a thing. Like there was definite kind of psychotic things in there. All right, they used to come out um, later on in the evening, as it were. Like, but then again, it could be perfectly articulate and nice and what you call it, very generous kind of like would share his last penny with you, like that sort of business, like and chat away as normal, but just. There was a certain spark that used to come out. Yeah, it probably used to come out with drink. What happened with Donnelly is that after kind of we stopped it off, he eventually, uh, very quickly lost. I mean, if you talk to the rest of his family, they still have northern accents. Donnelly lost his. He just straight away like that. Ah, you know, it's us again. Like, ah, fuck off, don't be a And he he developed a very strong Cork accent after a while. But the, the northern accent used to come out in a lot of the songs. If you hear a lot of them, like the Northern Act, you score all the time as a kind of a piss day. But uh, I, I, I think, yeah, he, he did try to be kind of more cock than the cock people, all right. I think the big influence was, uh, I don't know if you know, but there was a record came out called At the Campus, and uh, my friend's brother had it. We used to play it time and time again, and we couldn't believe it was actually cock bands who had a record or who had a, you know, a song on record and Urban Blitz and Mean Features, all these kind of bands. So we, it was the first time we'd ever seen a cock band on vinyl, so, you know, we quickly realised. Because we've been listening to U2 and Dexys and all this kind of stuff, and we realised, God, a cork band can actually, other than Gina Del Hayes and the Champions, can you know can put something down on vinyl. So, for me, you know, even when I was a kid, I, you know, it was something that did definitely stick with me. And it, you know, obviously, it's much more common in the last 10, 15 years. Cork bands have released a lot more vinyl, but I mean, that was a very brave thing uh, to do at the time. Down, 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 down. I'm from Nakanahini. I'm from that. Brilliant. And they, what was they had the one? Oh, they released the two, the two they had in single. There was um, Why Wait Until April and um, The Fish on Top of Shandon Swears He's Elvis. This song I wrote for you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. The cello was a big addition. And it was amazing. This idea of bringing a cello. God. We thought that's amazing, that's great. And it worked brilliantly, it really worked. I think Ricky's guitar playing got even more bizarre at that stage. You know, he basically stopped using chords completely. And uh, he started just using playing riffs and sort of counterpoint totally. And Don Lee stopped, stopped singing, and I think he started getting into sort of berating, you know, a berating thing. Mick was a, an amazing musician, absolutely fantastic. Started playing traditional instruments, started playing kind of mandolins. And, Great guitar player, could play the bass, play the piano recording, play anything. Brilliant, you know, worked very well with, with um, Ricky. And Smelly just was always just kind of natural, you know, nat- naturally brilliant drummer. You know, it was fantastic. I mean, the, 
DPs. So bear witness to that. It's like not a fish EP, I think it's tremendous, tremendous. I think it was early 82, if I remember rightly. They came back as Five Good Under the Sea with the cello player and everything. It was just incredible. I mean, it just, it was completely different to none attacks mostly. It wasn't like a rock band anymore. It was just like the most bizarre, but coherent. Like nothing went on for longer than two and a half minutes. Completely focused attack of extreme Cork eccentricity with Donnelly's sensibility for the first time. He was like singing in his Belfast accent some of the time. Because of course, he had lived there till he was what, 13 or something like that. And it was just unforgettable, really. I mean, that is the one thing that's like date stamped on my head. They're not quite date stamped, unfortunately. I mean, it was Donnelly roaring, but again, this, you know, as they got better with their playing and, and all that, and I mean, there was the core, the four, and then the three of them, you know, they, all, they could almost read each other's minds and, and music and stuff like that. You know, but there was a time when they had a cello player instead of a bass player, like, and that was amazing. That reincarnation was amazing. Like, you get these really just long holding deep bass notes, you know, and it just gave a whole different, ooh, orchestral layer to the whole thing. So I mean, oh, they they were very open to ideas and and stuff like that. There's people doing stuff like it today, and they're being called innovative, you know. And it, it's as I say they were ahead of their time. And I, I don't know, it was kind of ironic, really, but their last single before Donnelly's accident, like, that was Enemy Single of the Week, you know, and they were starting to get interest being shown in them. So who knows what would have happened. cello definitely gave them something and I mean she was a serious cello player I don't know where they got her but she used to play in the Irish Youth Orchestra I remember meeting her one night in Dublin we had gone to um, sure we'd gone to see The Clash in Dublin and we got lost and we were kind of wandering around up by Stephen's Green and we met her and she she was there kind of she was coming from the National Concert Hall with the the coat the dress the cello and the music and everything we were just going to say fucking hell like Jesus if I've gone to the sea, I've gone up in the world. You know, we were saying, well, where, where are you coming from? Oh, yeah, we, we, I had a gig tonight in the National Concert Hall. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. How did it go? And then she kind of said that she played in the Irish Youth Orchestra as well. I was, I was relieved, you know, because I'd have hated to miss them, miss them if they were playing there, you know. But um, I don't know where they found her. We were at a play. Actually, Mick Lynch was in the play. Owner was playing the cello in the play. And we kind of, kind of apparently after the play, and uh, we asked her. We didn't think she'd say yes, right? And then uh, she turned up. She just she turned up with her cello. It was amazing, right? She's here, here we are. Started playing, fantastic. And we decided to drop the bass in at that stage as well, like it worked. Started from Valley High and owners from Glenmire, and they'd be from completely different backgrounds to us, like we were coming from the work class Nari background. Different, completely different backgrounds. Like. But it seemed to work. It worked better. <laughs> that, could take, that could take the views better than Gertie, I think. <laughs> but it seemed to work. I knew we just carried on. I knew we exploded a few times about uh, bad language and sexist remarks and things like that. Like, but, uh, like there'd be people jumping around the place, like, they'd be falling up on the stage, and punk rock was falling on top of the cello, like, the cello was a life. Like, uh, Leave it alone! I would say stylistically and musically, to them, that was perfect. I mean, you couldn't have anything more spadgy than a cellist in, what well, you know, in a new wave band, punk rock new wave band, new wave spadgy band. Una, if I remember rightly, was a friend of a friend of theirs. I can't remember quite what the connection was. Because, of course, the thing about the spadgy scene at, at, at its zenith in early to mid-1980 was that uh, people who made me look like a fucking pauper were, um, were suddenly interested in what these groovy people from the north side were, were doing, you know? 
and for the first time in their lives they learn to use words like fla and, um, and, and, and langer. It might have come out of that. I mean, Una wasn't like that. She was very, very different from them. If, if I'm not mistaken, a, like a really A-rated music student at UCC. It was, it was like chalk and cheese, but they were doing this thing. They had this sort of pr- processional dum da da dum da kind of kind of feel about it. So you must have strings for that, darling. I mean, it was it was Brechtian, but they would they would urinate upon the very you know the word. You know, we were actually working class snobs, basically. Like we were from Grawn, we were from Churchfield, and we started to associate and like with like the Cahalno and all you know all these people that were in college and everything like that. It was a it was kind of, we, we were actually the snobs, they weren't like, do you know what I mean? Like we thought we were above all them kind of people and they were trying to be like us. We, we were the snobs, sorry. The working class snobs, like from Grawn, like, you know, walking up the hill, like, and they all probably being collected by their daddies at the end of the night, like. We are the Glee Club, come to manufactured in any way it was very genuine like he just was fairly loopy you know? and I suppose allowed the rest of us to be a little bit loopy then as well you know? that side of us came out I mean this is all in hindsight at the time we wouldn't have said that it was Donnelly it was just it was, we were doing it ourselves like yeah I mean the days in the arc and like all the bands that, that were happening it was such a buzz like you know there were people people were calling it the Lee beat at the time you know as opposed to the Mersey beat you know? Because every band that came out had a different kind of a take on them, you know. They weren't quite your normal punk rock bands that were happening in Dublin, you know. Who all seemed to sound the same. And each band that came out of Cork seemed to be, you know, they had their own take on it. And even now, listening back to some of the stuff from those days, I mean, the lads, you know, None Attacks, Five Down to the Sea, extraordinary musically. It really was exceptional. And his voice and his passion in his voice and, you know, this is all, again, hindsight. At the time it was just, ah, yeah, 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 they're doing their gig, we're doing ours, you know. I'm not quite sure where the scene developed from there, Katie, but somehow, but, you know, somehow there's an awful lot of young bands seem to come through. A lot of the young regulars started forming bands. And I think once they were in bands, they could, once they played there, um, we used to get a little mint for nothing. So that kind of, I suppose... They were kind of very much part of the scene. I suppose everybody, all oh, the kids wanted part of that scene as well. So more bands formed. It was kind of a self-perpetuating thing or whatever. I suppose I, I particularly liked the fact that um, there was a sort of, maybe kind of an inventiveness going. They were different from the other bands. They were different as well from, say, the punk bands that were happening sort of in the north of Ireland or in in Dublin, in the north particularly, they were very sort of, I suppose, influenced by the British scene. There was four or five bands in Cork then who were certainly more interesting than anything that was going on in Dublin. And bands in Dublin were still sort of at the stage of imitating what was what was popular or successful abroad, whereas bands in Cork were just were doing something that nobody else was doing. In a way, I kind of used to wonder why it was that Dublin, like a much bigger city, wasn't capable of producing music of this calibre. I think one or two, if you know, a half a dozen people in the scene can make a huge difference because they just, if people, if there's talented people who are just going for what they want to do, they can, they stimulate others to do it, but they also raise the, st- the general standard and they make people, you know, if there's, band, if there's two bands as good as Michael Disney and Michael oh, and Money Taxes, they were then go in, in the city, like everybody else has to sort of, has to try and compete with that. And also there wasn't the sort of thing that there was in Dublin of trying to, there was, it was in its early days, but there was a sense that you know you could get signed, you could make a career out of this sort of thing, you could you could get somewhere. So bands were sort of trying to second guess A and R men a lot, and I don't think core bands had that. I think they felt they were just out in the middle, out in the edge of nowhere, and they didn't have that sort of 
the thing that Dublin bands always have of trying to impress the industry. They just wanted to make music for themselves and for their peer group. But also I think that, like, they were intensely competitive and, and ambitious. Whereas you could get kind of comfortable in Dublin because you could play a fair bit. There was an audience that was big enough to sort of, every gig you did somebody could tell you, oh that was great, you know. You, you thought you were fine. Whereas in Cork you probably didn't have that as much. There was probably the bands themselves and a few friends. but. The, I don't know if there was that big a supportive audience, and I think they felt in order to to do anything they were going to have to get out. Although Disney and Mums Acts played in Dublin, and they weren't that interested in, in breaking Dublin, they, they knew they had to go further afield. Sam that drops on the ground Sometimes she dreams about Hollywood Sips turpentine to excess Bob, oh dear Bob When you gonna get a job Alfred comes home when I first heard Five Down the Sea, I was a Dubliner and I saw them in the Magnet on Pier Street. So I saw them as a bunch of mad cultures, but like absolutely mad cultures. They were the first country people who I actually had time for, you know. They had short haircuts, they looked mean, they drank a lot, they slept in their clothes, they woke up and they worked in their clothes. They were playing it for keeps, and it was obvious they were playing it for keeps, that they weren't just working in pop music because they thought it would be a nice way to advance their career. Some people have a special aura, I'll say for want of a better word, and it just comes off, it shines, you know, and they had it in spades. Their music was great, it had, it was two fingers to the world. They had an imagination that was all of their own, but it was all the time. mixing avant-garde with the country. I couldn't believe that such a thing could happen. I thought that if you had avant-garde, it had to come from the biggest city. I didn't think that if you had something this avant-garde, it couldn't be from the country and it couldn't be from people who would claim to be inarticulate. Because these people were as articulate in their own way. They are able to express what they wanted to express in a bizarre manner, in a manner that communicated when cut out all the all the middleman stuff just went straight to the heart of the matter. Because the thing you can't ignore, and I don't want to sound patronising about all of this, you can't ignore the fact that they came from a part of Cork where people were treated like subhumans for hundreds of years. I mean, Gran and Farnry didn't exist a couple of hundred years before, but, you know, the kind of working class people who were their ancestors, were their parents, their grandparents, had nothing but their humour to get them through a crap everyday way of life in a rancid fucking port town. Um, whose reason for existing had all but evaporated by the time we'd, we'd grown up. It wasn't happening, so time to uproot and go and, and try it. And like it was a bit of a hard struggle to start over there. To be honest with you, like, because it was like if you could remember the time in the early 80s where there was nothing, like, there was nothing here, there was nothing over there either. So there was no work involved, we couldn't do anything, and they said for about a year we were going around on the bread line basically, like, squatting it basically. Yeah. When we eventually got a gig, it was abstract, came along. Just wanted to make a record. Oh, grand, sound! How much did you give us? <laughs> and never came the money, like, but uh, we went to the league club then which was kind of the start of kind of a small hardcore following in, in, in England. Most of the following seemed to be up around the, the Midlands of England, or beyond that even Yorkshire, Leeds, and all them kind of people used to... The gigs in London nearly always were a disaster, to be honest with you, like, they, wouldn't, um, they didn't want to make it, was you see. You know, going to... Um, oh, the odd time you'd be invited to an old record company opening party, and like, fuck off, you know, we just couldn't, we couldn't 
talk to these people just in, in the way they wanted us to talk back to them because it just wasn't on. Like, we, it wasn't in our in our way. Like we couldn't, you know, these record company people. Like they just wanted a certain way of talking or, or, or to deal with them, and like, I I couldn't, and definitely definitely couldn't. Like. <laughs> We hooked into the whole kind of living room scene, the early creation scene. They were very much sort of fans of Micro Disney and, and Five Could to See. So we kind of started doing kind of shows and sort of for, for Anna McGee and people like that, 1983, 1984. And there was a kind of a bit of a synchronicity about our sort of existence in London, which was, which included the sort of the early creation, which was very much the early creation was like get the record company, it's very much like a sort of, you know, magazine, you know, a venue, a bunch of people. We never recorded for them, but as you know, Five Good Anthony eventually did. Like there was a band called the Fire Engines, Deeds, great band, and you'd, you'd hear all the guitar influences there. Uh, well, Mekons, obviously. Mekons, there was a crowd called Bogshed. Um, I could think of more, now, but, you know, there was, a, there was a few of them around that were quite innovative at the time, like. But the fact that we came from Ireland, like they, they thought we were from Blarney, like you know, it was a village in the middle of nowhere, like they, 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 they didn't know what to make of it. Yeah. In the 80s, the first worthwhile, in inverted commas, musical movement that came out of the British Isles was New Romanticism. And all New Romanticism was, was dress up in foppish clothes. That might make sense to you if you've got an awful lot of disposable income and if you're running around in a flash and trendy place like London. But if you're outside London, that means nothing to you. So anything that can that can speak to you, that you can call your own, it's going to become so important to you because it's articulating where you are, the place you feel in the world. And that's why Five Go Down to the Sea means so much to so many people. But it's part of the reason. The other part of the reason is there was just so much good fun live. Even though to look at them they look like a bunch of skinheads, live they had a sense of fun which was contagious. It just spread around the audience. They do the gigs completely pissed off their heads. They're all they're all mental, wild people, but they're incredible musicians. And then they wrote these like most, most complex, amazing songs that showed us that there's a fierce intelligence in there. You know, like you know, some people just, they're so intelligent they just go crazy. That's what they were like. You know, they're still just like misfits. And then they just they, they looked wonderful as well. They're just like a load, a load of mad guys had wandered up from the hills, <laughs> just like wandered into into rock and roll. They didn't want to be an underground band. Nobody wants to be an underground band. They thought they were Thin Lizzy, they thought they were a heavy metal band. You just knew that in their heads. They were thinking, we are a proper rock and roll, rocking band. And everyone's going, oh, fuck and see, aren't they nutters, making this great mad music. And they're thinking, they're pretty good. No, 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 you don't. There's nothing mad about us. We, we are rock. You know, that's what they thought in their heads, you know. So on one night in Preston, and they turned up with just a drum machine. And the drum, they couldn't get the drum machine to go in time with the guitars. And they just played, they just, so they just played along with the drum machine. There was ridiculous beats, pre-programmed beats all joined together. And it was still amazing. I mean, like, some people just have like, this music just go through their blood. And that's what they were like, you know. If by some sort of weird quirk of fate, Five Go Down to Sea staggered into the limelight, and it would have worked for them. They, they made me seem completely insane in 1984, but so did the Happy Mondays, and so did loads of other groups. And some groups get through, and some, some groups don't. And it was a tragedy that they could never hold it together long enough. They were, they, you know, like most bands go, oh, I'm really mad, I'm really insane, or, I'm crazy, I do crazy things. I mean, no, they don't. They, 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 they get they get they get a little drunk and, and uh, maybe have a fight with the drummer, but I can see did all those crazy things, didn't they? <laughs> some of the stories are grossly exaggerated, and some of them are not exaggerated enough. <laughs> some of them, like you know, they were a lot worse than what people are saying, and some of them are totally way around. Like, but you no, know, basically it's, it's fairly true. All right, he was <laughs> on the mint to chicken. All right, <laughs> he didn't care. He didn't have any fixed idea what he was looking for in business terms. I mean, none of the tax used to have this expression. Somebody was a business, like, or oh, Philip's a business. He was, because Philip had some interest in like getting gigs and stuff like that. Ah, Philip's the business. Philip's a langer. So you know, if you were, the, you know, it was it, that was the theorem basically. 
It's ipso facto. Like if you were a business, you were a langer. They were sort of people that you'd sort of look up to in one way, but at the same time, they definitely didn't aspire to what they wanted, what they were, because they were almost art in the sense of they just did it and they didn't give a damn about what it was and who came and who listened. It was like, this is it, and if you don't like it, well, then just out the door, I don't care. Whereas the bands I worked with were into like image and hair and stuff. Donnie always wore a black suit, white shirt, and you see him on the number two bus going down to Black Rock. He was still like sort of an enigma compared to, as I say, the guys I used to work with who wanted to be pop stars. Just Donnie just was, and the five belong to the sea just were. And there was no question of why do you do this and who are you and what does the name mean and stuff. It just it was plainly obvious that if you asked the question, you weren't going to get any answer other than fuck off. It was just an extremely warm day, like, myself and the, the girlfriend at the time, and there was another girl there as well, and the four of us just went into the park. You know, I had a couple of bottles of flags of the cider, but nothing too, you know, some people would believe you to believe that the Donnelly was lying going into the war, but no, no, no fear of that. Just a couple of, you know, nice, nicely, like. It was just so warm, like, that Donnelly, was, he was mad for swimming, like, he was always going to the swimming pool, and he just just went into the water, like serpentine in London, and swam half his out, but um, the, it's non, non-designated swimming area, so the, one of the lifeguard type persons came over and told him to get out. Danny went under to go, come out the other side like, to, to carry on, and uh, he just, whatever happened below, whatever he got caught on, some sort of reed or something like that, and that was it. Like. Just like not seeing him coming out, so I, 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 first of all, people on, on, before me, like, started shouting, screaming. So I ran, I ran over, then just rang the, um, the ambulance and uh, the whole lot, the emergency services, like, and that was it, like, then phone to the following day, like. We went home and uh, we started ringing a few, you know, because it was kind of a big circle of friends. We all came together in the squad, still in the squad. And uh, it was just moments of um, laughing and crying. At the same time, with us all, we, 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 we got a lot of cans, you know, the usual again, like drink, drink, laughing and crying. We knew it was all over. But the, the, the most, the, well, the most horrible thing I ever had to do was to ring his mother, like, I just fucking never again, like, he just never wanted to do anything like that again. Back to Cork, practically immediately, came back from the funeral. And uh, that was it. That was finished with London then. Finished with the music business, finished with everything. So that was the end of it. I mean, you know, this is sad in a genuine way because I can say with my hand on my heart that I wouldn't have ended up doing music if I hadn't met Donnelly, particularly, at all. Um, and if I hadn't done music, I would have ended up as a malcontented, alcoholic civil servant working at a food factory somewhere in County Offaly, like in the black bogs with the permanent fog hanging over them. So, I mean, I don't say this lightly. The, the cork that we are generally given, the version of cork that we have, you know, in terms of like the banks of my own lovely Lee and that sort of fellas singing song beside the, uh, the blazing fire with the baby grand tinkling in the background. That version of cork, which is so at odds <laughs> with what's actually a really funny and vibrant and, and lively thing as well. Uh, they, there's a very bourgeois public image of cork, which is sold to the world, uh, very, very middle class. There's a, the middle class sensibility in Cork is extremely strong and it needs something almost as mad as what people like Donnelly were on about to, as an antidote to it, I think. That's just bog standard theory of mine. 
unquestionably there there is some those uh, you know, the stuff that they did was inextricable from where they were coming from and that was uh, again what was was very good about them because like you know i think any good music it's symptomatic of where it comes from you know it just it doesn't just arrive out of a vacuum you know to coin the phrase like official cork uh, to this day probably doesn't even know of, of the existence of 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 in i'd say it's still it's still uh, Dixieland jazz down the yacht club on Sunday morning, like and Blazers, that's Cork to them, you know. But it's important to, to sort of uh, recall that there's another side to it as well, an un- underbelly or whatever. Uh, except I would regard the uh, the Dixieland jazz on Sunday morning as the underbelly, you know, um, the see the see me underbelly. All the best artists are, are self-destructive anyway. You know, to get the most out of your art, sometimes you have to go to the edge. Uh, and be destructive at the same time. And bands like Five Go Down to the Sea, you know, were self-destructive. Don Lee was a very self-destructive character anyway. I mean, they weren't motivated by, by stardom. They were motivated by making what they wanted to make, musically. And they didn't give a shit about anybody else and what anybody else thought. So, and, and that's the kind of music that usually stands the test of time. I mean, if you please other people and don't please yourself, and you reflect on it afterwards, it comes across the music, it'll always come across the music. It didn't last very long, like, well, unfortunately, don't we? Um, it ended that. Like, we, there was lots of plans of, of um, future things with Satanta. I think actually Don in his plan was to do Bohemian Rhapsody. To be honest with you, know, like the day he died, uh, walking through the park in Hyde Park, and he was kind of putting these bits together, like, <laughs> putting bits together for Bohemian Rhapsody. Like, and that might have turned out pretty mad, <laughs> The Dixies mean something to a certain generation, and Roy Gallagher means something to another generation, but not to mine. And even the Franks and the Sultans and Five Go Down to the Sea, they mean nothing to a younger generation now. But we should all know where we come from. We don't know where we're coming from. Where are we going? The fact that this guy came down from Belfast and, you know, had to sort of assimilate it to this kind of very odd little... Because Cork was such an odd place in those days, you know, it really was. It was like this kind of crazy little sort of the, the crazy little city over the hill over the hill is this mad little place you know they they do strange things down there and strange music and strange everything and I think obviously coming from Belfast coming from basically the thick of you know like the, seven, the sort of 70s troubles to this crazy little place must have been odd is uh, it, you know one of the things I've always struck by is the fact that nobody really apart from the privileged people who actually got to see them live got to hear their records you know, you, you, there's, there's so, so much music that's happened since then that it's, it was purported to be sort of exploratory and inventive and didn't go anywhere near the sort of the kind of length that the non-attacks of Vigil and Sea actually achieved. And, and you actually try to sort of talk about this and reiterate this to people in this, in this country. It's just, you know, it's very hard to articulate. It's very hard to get hold of the records. It's very hard to describe what they did. 